John 17, if you would, and keep your packet and your Bible handy. By no means will we clear this packet tonight. I hope by the grace of God, I thought to get through the first page, that might be a little different now, that's okay. And I want this, please, guys, to be as interactive as possible. This is your chance to ask questions about all the different parts of a church. How do you start it? How do you function in it? We're going to try to talk about even starting churches on the mission field. We're going to make this as, as broad and I don't want to say comprehensive because I don't think you can cover this topic completely, right? There's just too much to talk about. We could devote an entire year to it and get all the nuances and still you would get out into the, into the real world, if we can say it like that, into the ministry and find out there are even more questions lingering out there than we can cover. But we're going to try to initiate you as much as possible with the topic. So first thing, the definition of church, the word itself. It comes from a Greek word, ecclesia, as you can see there. And that word means a called out assembly. And the way we use that is in two different ways. And this is a scriptural thing. This is something you learned in discipleship. There's the universal church. So you are spiritually separated from the world. You're called out from the world and you're no longer part of them. You're now part of the body of Christ. And that's that spiritual separation. And then the local church, you are physically separated from the world. This is much like we're doing tonight. You've come away from the rest of the world and we are gathering together and physically you're in the room. Now, John chapter 17, let me show you how... Um, how this sanctification, this calling out, this separation works biblically. John 17, verse 14. Jesus says, I have given them thy word. Now, you know he's talking to the Father here in prayer. I have given them, the disciples, thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, right away you see a separation. And in this case, it's not as if the disciples were trying to create a division. The world actually did it. The disciples, they have the word of God, and then the world, the world pulls away from that. Number, uh, verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So our separation is not that of like an ascetic monastery type lifestyle where you pull away go live in the desert somewhere and have no dealings with the world how are we going to affect change in the world if we're not in it so we're in it but we're not of it that means our behavior our thinking our words our deep none of that we, we don't take any um we don't march to the beat how, how, how let me get my phrase right we don't march to the beat of that drum yeah, the, of the world's drum Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So that is what's going to separate us is following a biblical path for life and, of course, for the church itself. Uh, now, let's move. That's for definition's sake. You know what we mean by church. This is something we do cover in discipleship, so I'm not going to linger on that. All right, now the next part of our outline here, why start a church? And turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to take a look at all of these verses tonight. Philippians 2, verse number 15. <clears throat> all right, Philippians 2, verse 15. Why start a church? First of all, it is, it stands as a testimony to the world. Philippians 2 verse 15, the Bible says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So you see again, we're in it, but we're not of it. We're not acting like them. And that therefore we stand as a testimony of what the word of God can do for you. It changes you. It takes you from darkness into light. It takes you from corruption into this idea of preservation or salt. You're the salt of the earth, that type of idea. Verse 16, holding forth the word of life. So you see how we're going to shine that light in the crooked and perverse nation is by holding our Bibles there and living by it. Not just holding it up physically, but living by it. 
that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So Paul wants these disciples of his, his converts, the people he spent time trying to help them grow, he wants them to shine in this world. Now, everybody should be attempting this individually. However, the same thing that we would expect from an individual Christian to shine We also expect corporately from any local church is supposed to be in that community a shining light. Think of it like a lighthouse, right? And when the sailors are out on that dark, devastating, deadly ocean, they need to have something that they can focus their attention on and show them the way home. And that's what that lighthouse does. It says, come this way. You'll reach safely if you just follow the light. That's what we need to be as a church for that whatever community you're in, right? So corporately, Taking that, that corporate stand, that uh, solidarity, that speaks loudly to that community. It says it's not just one or two um, crazy folks that have this wild idea of this religion that they have. But man, there's this person, that person, the, all these groups of people from different backgrounds, different uh, social status, different income levels, different skin colors, different languages even, and yet they can pitch up love each other, unite, what is so powerful that could bring all these different people together? And that solidarity, that unity really says something. And just for the sake of time, I'll tell you where to find it. But in John 17, right where we were, Jesus goes on to talk about how important that unity would be and how it would be a testimony to the world. All right, so let's turn now to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And while you're finding that, let me mention quickly the idea of of Sabbath. And I'm not going to spend long on this idea because uh, we we talk about Sabbath in many other places. And I think we're all aware of the fact that God does not expect us as New Testament Christians to uh, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, right? That was a, a sign for the nation of Israel it was a special symbol between uh, between that nation and God of their covenant. However, There's some great lesson we should not leave behind uh, standing there in the Sabbath day. The idea of taking a day away from the world, away from your business, away from your job, and doing nothing but concentrating on the relationships in your life. You're thinking about, where did I come from? Where am I at? Where am I going? That time to contemplate, to meditate, to spend with God, to spend with each other, that's very, very beneficial. And I'm not pretending that at any point has the Sabbath shifted from Saturday to Sunday, okay? That, that was a Catholic invention centuries ago, and that is not the truth. The Sabbath is still always what it has been, Friday 6 p.m. to Saturday 6 p.m. But the idea, the principle of a Sabbath really makes a lot of sense. And think of it, if, if we were to, and I, I'm not, this is not a mandate, you, not everybody has to follow this, But I must admit, I I would love to give it a try sometime. Shut down the devices. I mean, the devices are already shutting themselves down, so (laughs) obviously they need a break. (laughs) But shutting down the devices and just spending that time doing what the Sabbath is, is meant for, rest. Just resting, unwinding, talking to people. It's got to be beneficial. And if the world saw us doing that, Right? We don't have to tell them that we're following the Old Testament command, yada, yada. We can just say, no, we're learning from that, that law. We're learning the practical lesson. And they see that <laughs> these guys, don't, they're not working on Sundays. Why is this day special? We spent it in the house of God and in the house of our families. I think that would say quite a bit to people. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, second reason why we want to start a church. It's structure for future, future generations. It leaves behind a template so the next generation can follow in these footsteps. Verse 15, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now Again, you see this connection between the local church and they're supposed to be holding up the the words of God, right? Pillar and ground of the truth. And we saw in John 17, thy word is truth. Right? So that we're holding that up. We hold that forth. Now, Paul is writing to a pastor, and he says, I'm writing this to you so that you know how to behave in the house of God. Well, good, but then this generation, what we are currently trying to build in our local church, some of you have children. 
We, we want, some of us have children. We want that next generation as we pass on or move away, we want to leave something behind that they don't have to recreate the wheel. They shouldn't have to relearn everything from the ground up, but we, we show them this is how you serve Christ. This is how we can make other disciples. This is how we can grow and help each other and so forth. All right, next thing, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. If I can make one quick sub point to this structure for future generations. Um, when we purchased this house, we, we um, purchased it from an old Tani. She was pushing 80 years old, and it looked like an old Tani's house. It did. The inside, it hadn't been redecorated in at least three decades, and that's fine. It looked like she lived there because she did. <laughs> That's, and that's no problem. I'm not going to say it was ugly or bad. It was just her style, and she's welcome to it. Uh, now, as soon as we moved in, we start making changes, and we changed the curtains, and we changed the paint on the walls, and as much as time allows, you know, we tried to make improvements, what we think are improvements, whether it's structural or just um, decorations. We're trying to make the home ours now, but at no point are we destroying the structure. It is still a house. When you walk by, you go, that's a house. You understand the difference between the window dressing and the structure itself. The church is allowed to change the window dressing. The fact that we have a different mic or use a microphone at all, right, or put a new coat of paint on a church building, or even, even, if I can step into dangerous territory here, God forbid we use music that was written in the last 20 years. <laughs> God forbid, right? But what if we actually brought in a song that was somewhat recently made popular? Let's, let's use that, that horrible C word, contemporary. What if we did bring it, what are we doing? We're changing the window dressing. The structure remains the same. Now, I get it. There are dangers involved with, with trying to appease and please everybody and just trying to dress up the building so that everybody likes that or dress up ourselves so that everybody is comfortable with that. I, I get it. There needs to be a bit of a line there. We need to be mindful. But the structure, the idea of winning people to Christ, discipling them, we're going to talk more about that. That needs to remain the same. All right, Hebrews 10 and verse number 24 and 25. You're very familiar with these verses. Why start a church? To provoke and exhort one another. So the Bible says here, let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, if I can maybe broaden our scope here a little bit, any group offers this, this kind of help, any social group. Let's say that you have a group of guys that like to play basketball. All right, how do we keep them excited about playing basketball? How do we get to be better basketball players? We hold regular meetings called practices. We get together and we throw the ball to each other and we shoot the ball and we talk basketball, we think basketball, and we spend a few hours with basketball every day. And what we're doing essentially is provoking and exhorting one another. We wouldn't use that terminology, but that's what we're doing. We're trying to get them excited and get them better at basketball. So that's just one example. I don't care which institution or which group, which social group you're talking about, that's how it works. And it works also in the spiritual realm. The difference with us is what are we trying to encourage you to do? What are we provoking you to get better at? What are we trying to keep your passion stoked up for? That's the difference with us. Now, we're not just a social group. I mean, this is obvious, and we're going to talk about that in more in just a moment. But guys, even a social group, if we're just socializing, that has benefits in and of itself, right? But the church obviously should be doing more than that. If I can also challenge us for a moment in our YouTube generation, so many people now are relying on YouTube, I want to say uh, as a crutch instead of a tool, because it, rather than go to a, an assembly of believers, right? They think, well, I've, I'll get my church in for the day. I'll watch a YouTube sermon. I'm not knocking the idea of watching a sermon on YouTube. Please make use of that tool, but don't let it replace this actual coming together. 
the, the idea of being together, that provoking and exhorting one another, you cannot get through YouTube. It's just not the same. Reading somebody's comment of, ooh, I like that point, or shop, you know, that, that can be mildly encouraging, but guys, it is not the same as sitting next to somebody who's under deep conviction. It is not the same as sitting in a church and hearing somebody say amen or hearing a testimony from somebody or going to a prayer meeting and hearing about some Tani's prayer that God answered. That stuff can stir your soul like nothing else can. So it's incredibly important that we don't limit ourselves to just something virtual or online. And then lastly, Matthew chapter 16. Why start a church? <clears throat> Why go through all this trouble to organize church services, to have uh, offices in the church, to have a Bible school, to prepare people to go out to other parts of the world and do this? Why not just send out a few gospel tracts? Why not just let people go to YouTube and listen to a few sermons? Why go through all the efforts of even building a church? But why do all of that? Well, Matthew 16, verse number 18. I, I, I think this by itself is enough of a reason. And I say also unto thee, Jesus speaking, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus started this. Now, obviously, he's not talking about a physical bricks and mortar building here, but the idea of organizing our efforts, coming together as a group, and mobilizing to go out and make disciples through, throughout all the world. The vehicle in which Jesus wants to get that done is the church. It's the church. The way that we're going to build the universal church is by shrinking that down and starting with the local church. And if you think about it, the local church came before the universal church. Before there was ever the body of Christ, there was a local church. Jesus started with that. As soon as the universal church started, I believe it started the day of Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit came down. I believe he baptized those believers into the body and actually started the body of Christ there. So the universal church started in a local church. Those two things were synonymous for a while. Do you understand that? In Acts 2, they were one and the same. So because you had 3,000 saved, that's how many members there were in that church both universal and local. So just for a short while, the universal and local church stood together. And then obviously when things grew, you had number, a multitude of local churches and always just one body. But Jesus started the church. So I believe that fact by itself demands our attention. It means it's important. And that's why this kind of a class is good to have. Whether you're going to start a church one day, and I hope some of you will, whether you're in the room tonight or watching later on, <laughs> <laughs> right if you're on the mission field I don't care where it's at or if you're never going to start a church you're just going to be in a church you need to be the best member that you can possibly be because this institution we can rightfully say God ordained right this is Jesus set it up then we should do our utmost in it look, look quickly at chapter 18 and verse number 15 and I want to point this out. I'm not going to dwell on it because in Matthew class we explain it further. But verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto thee, what? Unto the church. How can you do that on YouTube? You can't. Now, one of the greatest hindrances is in the local church is people not knowing how to resolve their conflicts, not knowing how to get along with each other. What did Jesus say about how people would know that we are his disciples? Loving each other. Did you know within any family, I don't care who it is, every family, brothers and sisters, fight. They fight. They, amen. You don't have to say amen. I know it's true. <laughs> That's true. We fight. I have fought with my sister more times than I can count, and I've never stopped loving her. That's part of family. That's part of, just because you love somebody doesn't mean you always get along with them. 
Come on, let's not be naive. Let's not be childish about that, right? Let's, as, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, uh, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spake as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. This idea of I live in a utopia where everybody just gets along. And when we go to church, everybody's just so nice. And we're all angelic and we're all saintly. And we're all treat each other perfectly. We're a bunch of saved sinners. And we have issues. And we, sometimes we're having a bad day. And we don't say it right. And it came out wrong. And I overreacted. And I, we need to know how to go to that person and say, listen, I, I messed up. Can we make this right? And that actually can build that relationship stronger than it was before. You don't get that on YouTube. See, Jesus has not only said, guys, let's put a church together, but then he gave it structure. He gave it order and said, this is how you handle these delicate situations. There's, there's an order to it so that we get to this conclusion. Not, not that we want anybody to go out of the church. That's the conclusion here, but... That what we're hoping is in step one or two, we can get it all straightened out and then press forward. All right, so we'll talk more about that in Matthew class. Get to Ephesians now, chapter three, and let's look at our third topic, three goals of a local church. And I will not dwell long on these because, again, in discipleship, we cover them. And I trust by now all of you have gone through discipleship. If not, I hope you're busy working your way through that. Ephesians 3.21. So three goals. Number one, exalt the Savior. Number two, evangelize the sinner. And number three, edify the saint. So number one here, Ephesians 3.21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Uh, amen. So exalt the Savior. Now we're in verse 21, giving glory to God through Jesus Christ. The idea is to keep the Lord Jesus Christ as the, the focal point. And the biblical Christ, not just repeating the name Jesus. I, I've, I've seen this to the detriment of churches, that we are a Jesus-centered church. So what they do, they go to church and in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of, and they just repeat it a lot. That's, well, I'm, I love the name Jesus, but guys, there's more to just, re, than, more to Jesus than just repeating the name. Keeping him as the focal point. Everything should somehow trickle back to him whether you're directly talking about him or you're taking some principle of his teachings and applying it to something else in life it all goes back to him he's the focal point now Ephesians 4 verse 11 evangelizing the sinner you'll see the word evangelist in that verse do you see it all right so there are other places in the New Testament where Paul talks about our responsibility we have a ministry of reconciliation and along with that, the word of reconciliation, which is the gospel. So we are supposed to mobilize individually and as a group and try to reach the people around us with the gospel. Let me point out quickly, we're not attempting to simply convert people. The idea is to make disciples of them, which is why we have three points or three goals and not just two. We want to exalt the Savior. We want to evangelize the sinner so that that sinner becomes a saint and then we get to point three, which is edify the saint. So Ephesians 4, let's just read a few verses here. Verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, this is all one long sentence, as you can see. It even goes on further than that. But what Paul's getting at is when Jesus went back to heaven, he gave gifts unto men. And the gifts in this passage... It are, they're listed out in verse 11. The gifts are the people. They are the offices of the church. And this is the local church. Right? This isn't the body of Christ, although that is in view later on in the passage. But he's talking about in a local church, you'll find these various offices, and those people are, are put into those offices to give that church structure and help those Christians grow. You can see that in verse 14, not to be children, protect you from false doctrine, and verse 12, perfect the saints, complete them, and prepare them for the work of the ministry. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, I touched on it just momentarily, the idea of, of a social club, right? A lot of churches, that's, that's the end goal. We are coming together to fellowship, which is the biblical word for socialize, okay? Now, is there anything wrong with that? No, we all need fellowship. Those kind of, a church bry without a sermon is okay, right? The fact that we come together and just bry and play, you know, frisbee or, you know, uh, rugby or something, that's perfectly fine. We all need that fellowship. However, that's not the end goal. That's part of it, yes. And as we've mentioned earlier, it can edify, it can provoke, and that's necessary. But we, this is why we've ordered it the way we did. The end goal is to exalt the Savior. That's the primary thing. So our fellowship has a purpose behind it. Not just, hey, I'm getting along with people, which is good. But I'm getting along with somebody else who is also in love with Christ. And by getting along with people like that, I'm hopefully going to be encouraged and exhorted. And when I feel a bit tired or weak or feel like quitting, those people are going to help me continue to follow Christ. So that remains our our end goal, our chief focus there. Okay, now we're going to get into some more technical things. And uh, I'm sure you're all excited about this next part, ecclesiastical polity, <laughs> which is the technical term, church governments. Now, this is actually, uh, it has more of a practical application than you might think, right? You look at these words and you go, I, I don't care. <laughs> these, these mean nothing to my life. How is this going to help me become more like Christ in any way? Well, again, Jesus started the church. He gave it structure. So let's, let's learn what these various structures are about, see what's biblical about them, what's not biblical. And uh, you'd be surprised, actually, how much of this goes on without us even knowing it. Some of it we just grow up around and we just kind of take it for granted. Now, before we get into any of them, uh, let me say that almost every local church has a blend of these. I, I really can't think of any church where it's just one one form of church government. There's always usually a blend. Now, I'll show you a great example of this with number one, the papal polity. Now, you see the word polity. That's just another fancy word for government, politics. Right? You can see the connection there. Papal polity. This is briefly explained by saying the church is governed by the pope. They call him the vicar of Christ. The vicar is a Latin word for substitute. You might be more familiar with the idea of a vicarious. That's sometimes the word that goes with it. But the vicar of Christ, who has full and supreme authority. So as people say, the buck stops here, right? For the Catholic Church, the buck stops with him. He gets the final say in all matters of faith and practice. Now, you might think of that and go, okay, well, that's the Roman Catholic Church's uh, polity. That's how they govern their church. They just look to the Pope, and that's all they have. That's actually not true. They do have this papal polity. Everything does go. He can at any moment wave his magic wand, for lack of a better term, and say, poof, this is what we now believe. And he's done that. Whichever pope it, it was, he has had the power to just say, now this is now true. I mentioned earlier the idea of the Sabbath. At one point, one of the popes just made a decree and said, the Sabbath is now Sunday. Done. Well, see, I, that's why I say may, he waved the magic wand and pam, this is how it goes. The idea of drinking the blood of Jesus and eating his actual body, that, has, that, that teaching only got written into Catholic law right around the turn of the millennium, around the 1000s, right around there. That's not a, that hasn't been around forever. The idea of Mary being the mother of God, one pope said that can't be true. And if anybody believes that, they're going to hell. And then a few hundred years later, another pope said, you have to believe that or you're going to hell. So one day we'll find out which pope <laughs> had it right. You know, um, So he does have that kind of authority, but there is a secondary, an underlying polity, and this is the next one, the episcopal, the episcopal polity. The church is governed by bishops of a particular denomination. And those bishops are tasked with overseeing dioceses rather than just one local church. Are we familiar with the word diocese? All right. Think of it like a province. I think in South Africa, that's probably the best way to think of it. Turn your Bibles to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. 
Now, next week, we will study the offices in the local church, and we'll talk more about the, episcop- the, the Greek word. Uh, uh, I think it's episcopate or something like that, or episkopos, but, uh, which is where we get the word bishop or overseer. How many of you know the term Episcopalian? We know that term? That's another word for Anglican. All right. In America, if you, actually, Anglican is not a very common word there. We know it, but most of the time, if, if you go to an Anglican church, on the church, it will be written Episcopal or Episcopalian, they call themselves. All right, so that's kind of one and the same. Now, the, the Episcopalian or the Anglican church, they are the head man there is not the Pope, but the Archbishop of Canterbury. All right. And then he kind of oversees all the other bishops everywhere else in the world. So they also have a bit of a papal idea to them. But for the Episcopalian approach, they say that the bishops will come together and they have, I think you're familiar with the term synods, right, or conferences. That's not just a Presbyterian thing. That's those synods or a enchia type thing. Synods happen all over the place. And when they come together in conference, these bishops will get together and say, what do we do about this problem? What do we believe about this? One of the more recent things is women in the ministry, you know, female leadership, what, uh, homosexuality, what is our official stance? And then these bishops will come to a conclusion and then tell all of the, they have different names for them, pastors, rectors, uh, shepherds. I'm th- there's a few other titles that they use, but they'll tell them, this is what we now believe about this. So those decisions start at the top and then I want to say are forced onto the others, but I'm, anybody can at their own volition, so I don't believe that, but that's where their official teachings will come from is those bishops making that decision. So Titus 1 and verse 5, he says here, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, lacking, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So this is kind of an Episcopalian idea, where Titus, I'm going to leave you in charge of, an, of a province or a, a, an area. You are in charge of Crete. So I want you to go to each local assembly on the island of Crete and ordain elders, pastors in all of those churches and give them leadership and structure and so forth. This is, and guys, for the longest time, this Episcopal idea is the, by far the most historic idea. By far, it was there before the whole papal idea was. And for centuries, this, this, is, what, this is how churches operated. Bishops, uh, they oversaw not just one church, but many churches in a given area. This is one example of that. And when the Reformation came about, all of that changed. Because the governments within a, a certain, the church governments within a particular area had become so corrupt, they said, we do not want some bishop living in another country making choices for us. This makes no sense. We're going to make our own choices. And then these other ecclesiastical polities came about. They said, we're going to we're going to use biblical principles to create a new church government. So we'll cover them just now. All right. So the Episcopal idea, let me point. I've shown you Titus 1 5. Let me tell you what I, I think the problem is here. Titus was commanded by Paul, ordain elders, give the church's structure, tell them what to what to do in the church. Titus was, it never says here that Titus is now permanently responsible for every decision in those churches. Much like the Apostle Paul, Paul cared for the churches, didn't he? We, we read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. He said that the care of all the churches comes upon me daily. Well, that doesn't mean that he's receiving emails and text messages and what do I do about this, Paul? What about that, Paul? Paul's not, he doesn't have that kind of authority. He's able to advise them and tell them this is what should happen in a church but when they ordain elders then those elders in that local church are now responsible for that church right they become the shepherd or the overseer of that church and then that apostle will step away and go do that same idea that same thing in another place and set up another church and on it goes like that that's the function of an apostle so that's when somebody maybe uses Titus 1.5 to say, well, the Episcopalian way, this is the right way. It doesn't really support the full-blown Episcopalian approach. All right, guys, I had hoped to get a little further down here, but um, I, think, I think we'll go ahead and stop there. I don't want to rush through these next two. I want to make sure we understand them properly. 
but we also need a couple minutes to try to get the live stream going. So uh, you guys have any questions about what we covered tonight? Yes, ma'am. That's right. Right, right. And this is precisely why I think the Episcopalian idea falls to pieces. Because you need to have a man on the ground in that church watching over that flock. And that's the job of the pastor, right? To watch over their souls. And there is no way, I, I, don't, I don't know of any way that the pastor can always get that right. To say this song, this preference, uh, no tablets, or you have to have a paper, by, or no matter which way we go on that, somebody could end up hurt. Somebody could end up offended. So rather, I would aim to do this, try to help everybody mature, and, and, and explain to them these are the real issues that demand our concern, fundamental type things. These other things are secondary or third dairy, or fourth dairy, <laughs> they're, they're just not that important, so have grace with each other. Guys, if this song is, is troubling you, if it really is a stumbling block that you cannot get past, then I hope that that church member would come to me as the pastor and say, Pastor, I'm, I'm really not comfortable with this. How should I handle that? That way the pastor knows that there is a problem, and maybe he can re-examine that decision and make some adjustments. Because there's no rule that says once you, once you say you have to wear a tie to church. Right? I know pastors that say that. You have to wear a tie. If you don't wear a tie, you are a stumbling block because you're making people think that church is not an important uh, occasion. So you have to wear a tie. Well, now that pastor could change that rule and say, okay, guys, you know what? That's, that was a bit much. It's the middle of summer. It's 42 degrees outside. Let's not wear ties. And somebody comes and says, hey, pastor, you know, Things are getting kind of sloppy in here. People are coming in their flip-flops and their swimming suit. And, you know, and, okay, then the pastor might re-examine and go, you know what, maybe we should move a little back, a little more back towards that. I, I think some of those things are going to be fluid, and he just needs to be paying attention to how, where his people are at, what they need at that time. I'm afraid there is no solid answer, though, that says this is always the right way to handle it. You can't always err on the side of old-fashioned. You can't always err on the side of contemporary. There is a strong argument. Guys, we have to understand that the reason things last for 100 years or 200 years, systems, the reason things become tradition is because they work. Right? They work. They serve a purpose. And if we go tearing down those traditional structures, we, we are left with nothing but chaos. Yet at the same time, if we say all we have is traditional structure, and you're not allowed to step outside of that. Now you're boxing everybody in. We can't grow. When God created the earth, right, there's a lot of opportunity for change. Things, th things can adapt, right, can't they? I mean, all living organisms can adapt. Seasons, right, things change. They go through seasons, and uh, things get cold, and then they get warm. It's okay if some things fluctuate. And I think that's more like the window dressing idea. All right, Sam, anything else? I get, uh, sorry, I kind of trail off there. Yes, Gary. A council meeting. Right. Well, it, it, it supports that practice of coming together, having a conference, and discussing difficult situations, yes. So, and, and I don't think any local church is going to have a problem with the idea of leaders coming together and discussing issues, right? Uh, the, that one example of how that church handled it, it's not going to match exactly the way 
um, what can I kind of say, the situation we have in the world today. Because back then they didn't have a hundred different denominations. There was just the church. <laughs> yeah, that was it. And then they sent message down to the other churches that had been started directly as a result of their work. So it was people they had direct influence over. So it's a slightly different thing than some bishop in Canterbury, you know, in England somewhere, saying, okay, you guys down here in Africa, this is what you have to do. That, uh, it's a bit of a stretch to, to take Acts 15 and make that fit every example now. But yeah, there's certainly validity in, in leaders coming together and fleshing out and working out difficult doctrinal situations. I think there's wisdom in that, for sure. Okay, anything else? All good? All right, let's take a few minutes. We'll try to get the live stream sorted out, and then Garrett will get you hooked up here.